This is Herschel Gordon Lewis. If you know who I am, God help you. If you don't know who I am, God help you. But what you're watching here or listening to is without your head. And I can tell you that I have contributed to the loss of your head. So thank you for being there. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal. That would make me terrible, Troy. Mm-hmm. And joining us is the director of many cult classics, some of my all-time favorites. We have William Lusting on the air, and I'm very, uh, very proud to have you part of the show. Yep, well, it's an honor. I'm happy to be here. Excellent. Yep. Yeah. Now, I uh, actually just watched uh, King Cohen, uh, the Larry Cohen uh, documentary. Now, uh, <clears throat> how did you get involved with him to, uh, to work on you know, a lot of projects? Um, we were introduced by a, 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 an executive at a lab in New York, um, very nice gentleman, uh, Dan Sandberg, who said, you know, you two guys, you're very similar. You guys should meet. And, you know, and uh, so he put us together, and, uh, and uh, within a couple of years, we came up with the idea for Maniac Cop. Yeah. It was it a good working relationship. Uh, it's it's had its hills and valleys, <laughs> right? It's like any relationship. Uh, 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 for Maniac Cop, uh, you know, I watched it again recently. I grew up, you know, I, I saw it many times. But watching it again, I'm, you know, you see stuff that you don't necessarily see when you're a kid. I'm like, you know, this had to be pretty edgy to have, you know, a movie where you you're just, you know, like the, the cop is a killer and he's not like a vigilante. He's just, you know, killing innocent people, and then like, uh. You know, regular people are, are shooting the cops because they're afraid. Was there, like, a lot of backlash at the time? Um, actually, no. There wasn't any backlash on it. It was, um, <laughs> there was, yeah, there really wasn't. Um, you know, the cops really yeah. have a good sense of humor. And my brother is mm -hmm. a prosecutor in Los Angeles, and uh, he actually appears in, in the movie. And uh, he had a poster of the movie hanging in his office, and of course, you know, cops came into his office all the time, and uh, it was uh, it was it was fine. They 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 get, they saw the humor in it. Yeah, it would probably be uh, worse today, I think, because uh, there's you know so much uh, you know Blue Lives Matter and and, and people kneeling you know pro uh, against the police and stuff. So I think it, it, you think it would be harder to put out today. I know there is plans to make a, a remake. Yeah, honestly, I don't think so. I think people see it as as a satire. You know that that it was a satire, and they see it for what it is. Uh -huh. um, it's I, I, you know I, I I really don't. I think this the, the movie kind of is what it is. It's not nobody really just takes it that seriously. Yeah, yeah and obviously, uh, Bruce Campbell is in it. What was uh, Bruce Campbell like at the time? Oh, great! Bruce is. Um, uh, it was Bruce's first non-Sam Raimi movie, and um, and uh, we had a lot of fun. He's a great guy, and he's a trooper, and he's a professional. And I have nothing but good things to say about Bruce. He was, uh, he was. I, I really enjoyed working with him. Mm -hmm. And what was it about Robert Zedar to... that made go on? Go on, sir. Well, um, you know, one of the things Bruce wanted to do all his own stunts. And he even wanted to do that stunt at the end of the film where the truck goes off the pier. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and he and I were standing together. I'll never forget this. We were standing together uh, watching, you know, um, uh, witnessing the, the scene with the guy, you know, with the stunt guy doubling for him. I said, Bruce, you still want to do it? You still wanted to do it? And, you know. <laughs> It was very dangerous, but uh, now Bruce is great. He he, he'll, he he wants to do everything, and he you know great guy. Oh, yeah. Good yeah. Now, uh, how about casting Robert Zedar? Because I can't really imagine anyone else playing Maniac Cop. Uh, did you know him beforehand? Like how did he how did he become the Maniac Cop? Um, he became the Maniac Cop because I had seen a movie that Robert Zedar was in called Night Stalker. Not, we're not talking the Darren McGavin. We're talking um, uh, one that was made in the um, in the eighties, and 
it didn't get much play, but I thought he was fantastic in it. Uh, he was frightening. And, um, and uh, so when it came to casting the Maniac Cop, he was always in my mind. I didn't know him, and uh, uh, I had the casting person bring him in. And frankly, the day he, I was to meet him, I, I was a little nervous because he had made such an impression on me. And he turned out to be a sweetheart, a really nice man. Rest mm-hmm. in peace. You know, really, really, yes. really nice guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was just asking about Tom Atkins because he was a guy I always uh, enjoyed seeing in any uh, anytime you pop up in a in a horror movie in the eighties. Tom Atkins. Uh, I, I met Tom Atkins when I would travel to L.A. Uh, from New York. I would uh, stay at a place called the Sportsman's Lodge in Studio City, and Tom also stayed there, and we would. Uh, run into each other at the at the hotel bar and uh you know I, I i really admired him i i you know his work and and we would chat and very very nice man and um i can't say we became friends but we became friendly and when maniac cop came along he he was like the first actor to pop in my head for that role and i really wanted mm-hmm. him he's perfect in it and uh how about like uh, getting like the parade shot? I mean, that's a huge, uh, you know, the police parade. Well, the parade shots actually were the first things we we filmed. Um, Larry and I had come up with the idea for Maniac Cop in I don't know, forget it in February, and um, and we didn't have a script, but the next month was the St. Patrick's Day parade in New York. So I uh, went out and shot the St. Patrick's Day parade again without a clue of how it was going to fit in the movie. I called up Bruce Campbell, who was living in uh, where he currently lives in Oregon, and I said, uh, "Bruce, I need you to fly to New York and wear clothes that we could duplicate later. I want you to star in a movie called Maniac Cop. Don't ask me for a script because we don't have any." <laughs> uh, we don't have a script, and uh, Sam was in New York, Sam Raimi, and uh, he was waiting for the financing for Dark Man. And I said, Sam, you want to help me shoot the St. Patrick's Day parade? He says, great, but do I have a role in the movie? So I told um, I told uh, Larry, uh, why don't we come up with something for Sam to do? And he became the uh, news reporter. And again, he refers to characters, and there was no script, and he refers to characters that had yet to be written. So it was kind of fun, and it all, and it fit in. It fit into yeah. the picture. When he said, "Yeah," now, when, when the, he said, he, "Go ahead." I was going to say, "Well, you're going to say," but I was going to say when you uh, said you didn't have a script, so was it just like an idea, maniac cop? Yeah, it was an idea. It was an idea, and. We didn't have a script until probably, um, I would say, six or eight weeks after we shot the St. Patrick's Day Parade. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And then we filmed the movie in August. We Actually, we didn't have the financing to make the movie. We, I, I, I kind of came out of my own pocket to go and shoot that stuff. And uh, then we uh, found the financing from Jim Glickenhaus, and uh, we started shooting the movie. Uh, we started pre-production in in July and started shooting in August. Mm-hmm. So how, how, really how far, yeah. How far along was the idea? Did you have like the basic, uh, idea of what the whole movie would be or was it just the maniac cop is a cool name? Well, the truth is, yeah, that was it. We had the, we had the title and we had a <laughs> copy line. You have the right to remain silent forever. So, <laughs> so with those two things, the copy line and the, um, and the title, we, we knew we had a movie, and now it was just a question of shooting it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, how about uh, uh, filming in New York itself? I always think any of the New York movies of the 70s, 80s always have like a really special feel to them. Well, in the case of Maniac Cop, we only shot in New York uh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade plus an oh, okay. additional three and a half days. Oh, all right. Uh, the rest of it was shot in Los Angeles, doubling for New York. Oh, okay. Uh, but so, I did uh, shoot <laughs> Maniac and Vigilante entirely in New York. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to Maniac. Maniac's uh, 
this might sound strange, but one of my favorite movies since I was since I was a kid was uh, was Maniac. Probably I since I was very too. young, like six or so. Yeah. But uh, Maniac Cop Two, I always like it when the sequels pick up right where the other one ended, uh, and even you get to see like the end of the previous movie. Yeah, well, uh, that was the intent. The intent was it was a direct sequel um, and picked up right after the uh, first one ended. Mm-hmm. And uh, I kind of liked it because it reminded me of the Republic serials. Uh, that's how I kind of saw it, as yeah. a Republic serial uh, mm-hmm. kind of thing, you know, from the 30s and 40s. Mm-hmm. When, when do you consider Maniac Cop becoming Supernatural? You know, I, I, when I was doing the first Maniac Cop, the truth is I really hadn't figured out exactly what he is. I, I, I couldn't figure out if he was a zombie or he was a, a vengeful cop. I sort of settled on a restless ghost idea that he was a, that, that, you know, it was a, 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 a the spirit of somebody who, who, um, who had come back, um, with a to settle a score um mm-hmm. did you ever did you guys ever see a movie called point blank with lee marvin oh yeah i remember mm-hmm. that one now to me maniac cop and point blank were um it kind of had the same thought i had the same thought and if you watch point blank you can look at that as a restless ghost movie mm-hmm. um you know, I don't know if you, how when the last time you saw it, but if you recall at the beginning of the movie, he gets screwed over during the, the during the heist by his friend who right. shoots him and leaves him for dead in a jail cell on Alcatraz. And if you remember, uh, Lee Marvin had uh, like brown hair in that scene, and then it picks him up on the on the shore of San Francisco, and he's got the trademark Lee Marvin gray hair. And, uh, and when he's talking to people, often they don't look at him. He's talking away from them. If, I'm going to have to see look, the movie again. <laughs> yeah. You look at it and, and you could, and you could, you could look at it as being a ghost story, um, of this gangster who had been screwed over and he's coming back in to get his, his revenge. Cause all he has is one thing in mind is getting his money. And in the end, when they give him his money, all he does is recede into the darkness. He backs into the darkness, doesn't go to get his money. The money sits there. The helicopter pulls away. His money is sitting in the middle of Alcatraz, and he has sort of gone back into the darkness. He recedes into the darkness. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, so in my mind, that's what Maniac Cop was. Mm-hmm. Was Lee Marvin in Point Blank. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I like that his, uh, you know, the makeup has changed uh, to just show, like, his face is, uh, you know, is worse uh, from the first movie. In the second one. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, we kind of improved I, I, a little bit on the makeup or, you know, it was... We were, we, we, again, we were, I had actually shot all of the close-ups of the maniac cop in the first movie and went back and changed the makeup and reshot them. So Mm -hmm. it was, so maniac cop two was sort of a third, uh, version of the, of the makeup. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it was kind of hard to settle on it. Yeah. So uh, I like, uh, you know, he kind of, a friend in the movie, it kind of reminds me almost of Bride of Frankenstein when, when uh, Frankenstein finds the blind man. But, uh, you know, this guy's not as benevolent as, as that guy. But uh, uh, where did, well, I don't know if you, you wrote it up, but uh, where where did the idea for the friend come from? Are you talking about the serial killer? Yes. Well, um, the idea of the serial killer came from Larry Cohen. Um, but my, my, um, my direction to the actor in my thinking is I saw him as Igor and, and son of Frankenstein. I saw okay. him as Bella Lugosi. Yep. Yep. Lugosi in that one. And that's why we have that beard 
and everything. And so uh, what Leo did was kind of run with it and make him a white trash. You know, obviously he's not going to do a Hungarian accent, but he's, he's <laughs> gonna, he, he made him a, a white trash Igor. Yeah. And yeah, I like it. That was the uh, that was the idea of that. And uh, Robert Davi, I, my only direction to Robert Davi is, I said, you're you're Robert Ryan in the movie On Dangerous Ground, <laughs> and that was it. You know, <laughs> that's who I wanted. <laughs> uh, See, the key all... to the, the key to the Maniac Cop films mm-hmm. is the actors don't know they're in a comedy. Everybody's got to play it straight. Everybody's, but what's going on around them is ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So that's how I've always looked at the Maniac Cop films. They got to play it like, you know, with gravitas. And, you know, so Robert Dobby is so perfect for that. He was so perfect in Maniac Cop 2 for that. Yeah. yeah. And if you have people not playing it serious, then it just comes off like campy. Exactly. I didn't want that. I wanted it to be... You know this, this, you know, you know, you know this kind of, you know, ridiculous premise trapped in in a in a police movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of a uh, man on fire, and uh, and this is you know pre CG man on fire. A lot of like even fight scenes with with a uh, maniac cop on fire. What was it like? You know, what's it like to shoot that? Uh, especially for so many well, scenes. Usually, if it's made of fire, they just kind of walk and they just follow. Yeah, no, it was a very slow, slow process. I want to. I, I my recollection um, was that it took at least three or four days to shoot that scene because it was so. I'm talking about just the interior of the prison. I'm not even talking the high fall. I'm talking just the interior prison. Uh, my recollection is it took at least three or four days to shoot. It was just a very wow. slow, slow process. Well, you mm-hmm. can't rush somebody who's going to be lit on fire. <laughs> yeah, so, right. you, you know, you, you, you set up the cameras, you let the stunt people do all the safety checks and everything else. But, you know, uh, the, the guy's going to go on fire. And, you know, you can't say, okay, hurry up. You know, we're going to break for lunch. No, you got to just have patience and let them take the time they need. And uh, they did a fantastic job, and they didn't waste any time. You know, they, they did what they, you know, they did a great job. Oh, definitely. It still holds up. That's one thing I think never looks good in modern movies is any of the fire stuff that, that's uh, uh, generated because it never never looks right. No, the hair doesn't Yeah, it's funny. I just watched me. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was just saying, with like a computer-generated fire person, yeah. it just doesn't look natural. It doesn't. But I got to tell you, having said, you know, I, I agree with you. But when I watched it uh, the other day, I was uh, we screened it in New York, and I kept going, God, you know, what I could do if we had some computer enhancement, you know, that we could do to the fire, because <laughs> the continuity of it is, you know, kind of changes from cut to cut. Mm-hmm. But it is what it is. It's, uh, you know, what are you going to do? Yeah. What's that like when you when you go to the screenings and you watch uh, your, your movies with an audience? Um, well, I really, I, 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 I'll show up at screenings, but I'll usually sit outside. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, I, I don't often sit through the movies. And, um, uh, you know. So it's it's I had a fun I you know it was fun I the one we had in Philly a few weeks ago and in New York I mean they were fun but I I I can't sit through the movies often I usually come in towards the end because they they're you yeah. know I'm getting ready to be called up to do the Q and A yeah yeah and uh, well then you can catch the rap what what was the story behind the maniac cop rap. The story was I wanted to end it with a with a with a laugh. I wanted to tell the audience we didn't take it seriously and you should either. And that's what the rap was uh-huh. about. I came to Jay Chataway just almost as a joke. I said, Wouldn't it be funny if we had a maniac cop rap song at the end of the movie? And while you know, unbeknownst to me, he went off and uh worked with a couple of people and came up with the song and 
the only reason I knew he was he was going to do it is while we were mixing the movie, he was bringing people in for auditions, and I'm wondering why these black groups were coming in to the studio. I had no idea they were com- they were kind of coming in, and he was going off and meeting with them, and and that's when I found out that he was auditioning people to sing the Maniac Cop rap song. <laughs> <laughs> what did you I think of it, it when I, you first heard it? Oh, yeah. I, I thought it was fantastic. It was, yeah. it was so, it was so, it was just great. I love no, the thing where no. he goes, uh, uh, you know, shoot him with a jacuzzi. He'll wind, uh, no, shoot him with an Uzi. He'll wind up in your jacuzzi. Come on. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. You gotta like that. Uh, no, uh, a lot of people consider Maniac Cop 2 one of the best horror sequels that they some people, a lot of people like it better than the first one. Well, what are your feelings on that? Well, I got to tell you, um, when I was making, uh, when the, when the, when the, uh, when the idea of doing a Maniac Cop 2 came about, uh, I was really reluctant to do it because at that time, and even today, you put a two at the end of the movie and it's inevitably going to suck. I mean, very, very few sequels. <laughs> Are equal or surpass the first movie, mm-hmm. and um, when I um, when I read Larry's script, I was pleasantly surprised. I said, "Boy, this is really good." I really, you know, I started to see the movie in front of me, and that's always a good sign. And so, when I was making uh, Maniac Cop Two, when I was preparing it and shooting it, the words, you know. I, you know, in my head kept going, you know, don't make it suck. Don't make it suck. You know, I really, really worked hard to make it as good, if not better than the first movie. I kind of looked at it as a, as an improved, a new and improved version. So um, I'm pleased that the way it came out, I think we succeeded in my goal of not making it suck. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that that's that was I I I did it you know we we uh, mm-hmm. I met my goal yeah and I uh, uh, you mentioned her uh, Laureen uh, Landon in the movie uh, I see her she's in a lot of uh, Larry Cohen movies I don't know if she's friends with him or not but yeah she's uh, very how is she good getting friends with Larry oh, well okay. that's just it she's friends with Larry yeah she sort she's of came. Yeah, she. It was a kind of a package deal that Larry wanted me to put her in the movie. Uh, all right. Uh, how how but, was she to uh, work with then? Um, it, she was okay. You know, she was okay. Um, mm-hmm. you know, she was fine. She, uh, um, yeah, Laureen, Laureen was okay. All right. Uh, so uh, maybe a cop three. Uh, so you're happy with the second one? When does uh, when does it come up to do a third one? Well, almost immediately, um, you know, there was a real want for a third picture and I was busy on another film and, uh, I wasn't available, uh, to do part three and, um, and I frankly didn't want to do it. I was not crazy about the idea of, I kind of feel like I was pushing my luck and, um, and, uh, Larry, uh, wrote a script not nearly as good as Maniac Cop 2, but not nearly as bad as what the finished film Maniac Cop 3 turned out. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was really a, a much different movie than, than what you see in Maniac Cop 3. Um, it was uh, much more of a... Well, firstly, Robert Davi wasn't... His character wasn't in it. It was a black detective. The movie was set in Harlem. And... Um, it was just uh, really a different movie. And uh, the problem that we had was th- that uh, the Asian territories, in particular Japan, wouldn't um, co- commit to, uh, you know, to their portion of the financing of the film. Um, and uh, it turned out that their reluctance was having a black man in the lead. And, oh, wow. um, and so... Uh, to make a long story short, I, I I was I was sort of pressed upon me. Could we could we change it and put Robert Davi back in the movie? And you know the domino effect of it was something I I sh- I should have foreseen. We should have 
you know, we should have shut the movie down and, re, and redid the script. You know, we were in pre-production when we had to make that change. And we, we, we never recovered from it. It just became shooting, a, you know, a, 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 it was like shooting two movies. You know, it was like, um, it was crazy. It, it just mm-hmm. never, it, it just didn't, it just didn't fit. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, did that hurt? It was a mess. Yeah, go, on. Mm-hmm. go ahead. So, I'll say at that time, did that hurt your relationship with Larry? Um, maybe a little. I don't know. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it really hurt our because we because I understood his position. Larry's position was: look, I wrote a script. Everyone was happy with it. You started pre-production. Now you're asking me to go and write an entirely different script. I want to get paid for it. The position right. of the producers were, well, we already paid you, and now we're, you're asking to be paid again to write a, to write a different script. Um, and I think Larry was more right than wrong, because it was mm-hmm. an entirely different script that, that, that was needed. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, so I can't, but I kind of felt I was kind of left out, you know, kind of put in a really difficult position. Mm-hmm. So when you saw the finished product, uh, what did you think of it? I hated it. I just yeah. felt that it, it was what I knew it was going to be. It felt yeah. padded. You know, there were some moments in it, you know, that I thought came out pretty good. Um, but um, for the most part, I, I just really hated it because it, it just felt padded. Because when we ripped out all the stuff that was specific to the original script that Larry wrote, we wound up with maybe a 60 page script and we had to make a 90 minute movie out of it. Yeah. So there was so much of it. I didn't, a lot of that padding, I didn't even shoot. It was shot by the producer, Joel Swasson. And, um, cause I, I really couldn't put my, yeah, I, I couldn't do it. I was just sitting there looking, I was bored. And I said, this is crazy. We're just shooting stuff to fill up running time. Mm hmm. So it was not a good it was not a good experience. Mm-hmm. So was there ever talks to do a fourth one? Um, no. I, they, I funny enough, Maniac Cop Three was successful. <laughs> <laughs> I know it sounds strange, but it's right. as bad as I thought the movie was from a from a financier's point of view. It was a profitable movie. Mm-hmm. Um. And but they knew that I that I was so unhappy with three and and I was kind of the linchpin. I mean, if they were to do a four, they had to hire Larry and I to do a fourth mm-hmm. one or pay us off. Right, right. So it was a kind of a from a legal standpoint, it just it was just a a, a situation where uh, it made it impossible for them to do a fourth one. And I don't think Larry and I really wanted to do a fourth. I didn't. Mm-hmm. I don't know about Larry. I didn't. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I wanted to move on. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, stocks, uh, there's uh, Maniac Cop remake. Uh, is that happening? Yes. It's, it's, again, it's not really a remake. It's a kind of a re-envision, a mm-hmm. re-envisioning of the concept. Um, Ed Brubaker wrote the script. Uh, Nick Reffin is producing it, uh, and, and uh, uh, John Himes is directing it. Um, the thing is, is Nick got, uh, got uh, well, he got extremely busy doing this Amazon series that he's still in the midst of, of directing. Uh, he's, direct- he's directing all 10 episodes, and he doesn't finish with it until the fall. So uh, the Maniac Cop project had to be pushed till 2019. Oh, okay. Have you read the script? I've read a draft of the script. I haven't. I don't know if I've read the final script, or even if there is a real. I mean, there's never really a final script, but I don't know if I've read the latest draft because I know that yeah. that Ed and and John were doing some additional work on it. Hmm. Well, you not obviously can't talk about it, but uh, were you were you happy with it? Yeah, it's different. It's not it's not the the maniac cop of 
Larry Cohen and Bill Lustig. It's mm-hmm. um, it's taken a um, much more seriously. It's it's uh, you know I Larry writes stuff as as you know satires as as uh, you know uh, and and I I kind of directed it like you know tried to find all the humor in it. And I kind of felt felt that the direction that these guys are going in is 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 kind of taking it seriously. So mm-hmm. we shall see. It's a different take yeah. on it, and they're all talented people. So mm-hmm. I I have confidence that they're going to do what's best for the project. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's go back to Maniac. It's uh, honestly one of my favorite uh, horror movies. And uh, so, how did you get involved in Maniac and Joe Spinell? I met Joe Spinell when I was a production assistant on a movie called The Seven Ups. Uh, Joe played a thug in there, and he and I um, chatted. Turned out he was a, um, uh, you know, he was he, he was a huge horror fan, and uh, you know, when horror fans meet each other, it's um, it's kind of like a bond, you know. You start <laughs> yeah. chatting about, oh, I love this movie, I love that movie, you know. Uh, so Joe and I became friends, and uh, we um, we kind of talked about let's let's make a horror movie, and we, you know, we developed some ideas. Joe was very busy as a character actor, work going all over the world working in movies, but we would talk on the phone, and when he'd be in New York between movies, we would get together and. And, and brainstorm ideas, and um, and we always ran into a roadblock in raising money. You know, the, we would come up with ideas, and we just they were too ambitious, and we just could not raise the money to make them happen. So finally, out of frustration, um, we decided the script that we had for Maniac. We decided to pare it down, focusing on just the killer and. and Getting rid of all the peripheral characters, and um, and uh, putting our own money in the bank, and started shooting the movie. We started we we shot the movie for forty eight thousand dollars, and uh, we just did it with our own money. And well, that's uh, amazing. Yeah, yeah, but I, that wasn't what the final cost of the film was because we went back and added Caroline Monroe. I mean, the yeah. character was there. We just hadn't shot those scenes. Oh. Uh, so we had, uh, we had shot, I think, about three weeks. Uh, and then we ran out of money, but we were still editing the movie. And, uh, and then, by chance, Caroline was in New York for the Fangoria Convention. And Joe and her reunited. Joe and her had done Star Crash. Mm-hmm. And, um, and her husband said, I'll raise the money you need to finish the movie. And he wound up raising uh, seventy five thousand dollars, and with that, we finished the movie. Cool. Post production and, uh, uh, and so everything. You said her character was already in it. Uh, was she already cast to be in it, or was no, someone else? No, play but that there character? was a character yeah. that was in the script that was intended to be. Um, it was intended to be. Uh, you know, uh, we wanted to put somebody who had a little bit of celebrity in the part. And we hadn't cast it yet, so it just all kind of it just all fell into place. It was sort of fate. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I that's about the poster because uh, to me, I, th- I think it's my favorite uh, horror movie poster. You know, it's really sleazy, obviously, and uh, it's just awesome. Uh, did you have any uh, any hand in, in uh, designing the poster? None whatsoever. It was done by uh, our distributor, Analysis Film Corporation. Um, they called me in when they had the poster, when they had, you know, a sketch of the poster. Mm-hmm. And I was, I was taken aback by it. <laughs> uh-huh. And I didn't know what to make of it because I had never seen anything like it. And, um, and these guys were so happy with it. And, uh, and so, um, you know, and I really had nothing negative to say about it. I just sure. was so shocked that they were going to go out with a poster like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, so, um, I, it was their idea. They were brilliant. Those guys. Mm-hmm. So, uh, w- 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 was there any backlash to the poster? Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, that was the thing. That was the lightning rod was the poster. 
Uh-huh. That's what got us the attention was the poster. Uh-huh. Uh, that 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 rattled all of the cages, all the women's groups and press, and it it brought down everybody on us. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it also brought attention to the movie. So. Pardon? I said, but it also brought attention to the movie. It did. I'll, I'll tell you something funny. MPAA for years used the Maniac poster as an example of why they had to approve any movie that was MPAA rated, <laughs> saying that this poster represented everything they they they're against. <laughs> so I was, I'm kind of I'm kind of proud that it was it was you know of having that. Um, yeah, that's a yeah. distinction no one else has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it definitely it definitely was a. I mean, I'm I'm happy. I mean, the film. You know, we just did a 3D version of it. We just really? um, yeah, because we're coming out with a a new Blu-ray, and uh, mm-hmm. we did a new. What happened was about two months, three months ago, uh, we found F, uh, the long lost 16 millimeter original camera negative of Maniac. Mm-hmm. Everything up till then, up to now, had all been transferred from the 35 millimeter blow up negative, and uh, all the video transfers, all the prints, everything was struck from that 35 millimeter blow up negative. So now we found the negative, which was it goes back a generation to the original negative that went through the camera, and so mm-hmm. we've we've we scanned it in 4K. And we're about to do a, a new Blu-ray release. Mm-hmm. And uh, wh- why 3D? Pardon? Why why 3D? Oh, just to give the uh, the the cover a distinction, mm-hmm. because you know the, the, we're going to use the same artwork. We wanted to give a distinction over what had previously been out. So we we did, we 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 tried. We did an experiment to do a a three D cover, and it came out spectacular. Mm. So uh, that's what we're going with. Yeah, and we're going to be see, doing, I, we're yeah. going to be doing I thought you meant a three D movie. Mm-hmm. Oh no no no! we oh no! We need to make a three D uh, movie. Yeah, that's uh, what I thought you meant but, too. I was like, no wow, no! That's it's the, oh, the artwork. <laughs> oh, we were, we were yeah, talking yeah, about the that's artwork. Very cool. Yeah yeah yeah! I got you. And um and 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 with the new 4K restoration, we're doing screenings all around the country, and around the world. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! No, very great. Cool. Yeah, uh, prior some, to the release of the Blu-ray. So, so when you do the restoration, um, because I uh, usually restorations are amazing, but uh, sometimes on like a on like gritty movies, I think they make them a little too bright. Is uh, are you going to be kind of hands on on the restoration? So oh yeah, gonna, I'm definitely know. hands on on the restoration on on the film. Um, I don't think that's going to be a concern of it being too bright. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, the movie will have its inherent grittiness because it was shot in 16 millimeter on location, mm-hmm. often without any any lights. So it does have an inherent grittiness to it, um, but. Uh, we're not going to use any DVNR or anything to smooth it out. We're not doing any digital noise reduction. Everything, mm-hmm. all the restoration is all hand restoration, which mm-hmm. requires hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it's so, more like a labor of uh, love kind of thing. No, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's a labor of love, just sure. A lot of but work, I mean, it's, yeah. it's just a lot of work. Yeah. It's, it's what I would do even if it wasn't my movie. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, Cisco and Ebert at the time they did like you know specials about um, uh, women and in, in, uh, women and I forget their the terminology is women in danger I think movies. Uh, when that was going on, uh, did that hurt your movie? Did that help the movie? You know, what, what, what did you think of you know uh, such uh, the big uh, movie critics you're talking about these movies on TV? Well, it certainly drew attention to the movie. Um, mm-hmm. In some places, it did hurt, uh, where we had uh, street protests, like in Philadelphia. Um, you know, there was women's groups who were really um, riled up against the movie, and um, it hurt our distributor because a distributor doesn't make a profit theatrically on a film until like the third and fourth week of its run, 
and mm-hmm. um, and the theater owners were pulling the film after the first and second week, stating that, look, you know, we got these protesters and we have to live in these communities. You don't. And mm-hmm. uh, so it kind of hurt the distributor um, uh, a little bit, and it hurt the... Um, you know, it hurt the, the, the film rentals against, you know, what the, their cost was for all the advertising. Mm-hmm. But, um, did, go ahead. Did, he, did either of them actually ever review the movie? Yes, they did. They, they, had, a, they had a show um, where they, they had a thing at that time, they called them, they had the dog spot. I don't know if you remember that. And spot yeah, the dog, they would, little, you yeah, would, they, yeah, they, they would say enough. dog of the week. And uh-huh. so Maniac was on one of their shows, the Dog of the Week, and they they gave it a you know a scathing review. But funny enough, I met Roger Ebert years later. I was editing Maniac Cop Two, and he was editing something in the Jason editing room. And I uh-huh. went in and introduced myself to him, and we chatted. And he, you know, he's it was a very he's a very well he was a very nice guy. And I had a Maniac poster hanging in the editing room. <laughs> and I brought it in. I said, Roger, would you mind signing my maniac poster? <laughs> and, and he said, to Bill, your movie must have, your movie was Dog of the Week, but you're a really nice guy. You're a pal, Roger. <laughs> so that was very nice of him. All right. We're back here. And sorry for uh, the technical problems. But uh, we're going to talk about uh, Maniac. And uh, Joe Spinell, who was in, you know, he's in a lot of like, uh, a character actor in a lot of big movies and uh but he had no problem like uh being like a real sleazy you know killer and maniac so well go ahead no you could go on what you say no joe uh joe loved making maniac it was it for him uh a starring role and owning uh uh you know profits in the film and uh it was those two reasons, I think those were his two primary reasons that he wanted to make the movie. Plus, he loves horror films. Um, what happened was, Joe did a movie with Warren Oates, and Warren Oates said to Joe, he said, you know, the most money that he ever made on a movie was yeah. from Race with the Devil, because he owned, him oh, and yeah. Peter Fonda owned percentages of the film. And that stuck with Joe, that there was gold in horror. And, uh, yeah, and it came from Warren Oates with, uh, it came from Warren Oates. Mm-hmm. So how about the scalpings in the movie? Uh, cause I don't think I've ever seen that in a horror movie before that. Yeah, we were looking for some, you know, some new things that n- none of us had seen. And, you know, you were talking about Joe, myself and Tom Savini collectively. We must've seen every mm-hmm. horror film ever made. <laughs> oh Yeah. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, we were trying to do things that, it, that we had never seen before. And, or if we had, we tried to find something innovative, you know, to, to do with it. And so, yeah, that's where the scalping came in as a kind of a trophy. Because, you see, what Joe did was create a compilation of serial killers in his character. And one of the things that serial killers would do is, is take a trophy from their murders, and then we said, well, if he, if he, what kind of trophy would he, would he take, and what would he do with it? And that's where the idea of him having mannequins, uh, that he had an obsession over mannequins, and uh, he would take the scalps of his victims and some of their wardrobe and put it on his mannequins. How about just technically uh, pulling off like the the, the scalping? Oh, it was a very simple, simple, uh, from a from a, uh, a special makeup effects standpoint, all it really was was uh, mortician wax and, uh, and creating, and Tom creating an appliance uh, to put over the, the, the hair and, uh, of the actress. But mm-hmm. uh, it was very simply done, and that's what makes it effective. I think yeah. when you get involved with CGI killings like they had in the Maniac remake, I, mm-hmm. it, it, somehow you know it's CGI. Even if you don't know, 
you know, no, no, it's CGI. You sense mm -hmm. there's something unnatural about it. Right, right. Whereas yeah. the way Tom did things, it was very organic. Mm -hmm. I always think there's something about, like, the weight's not there on the CG. And like exactly said, even if you would know that, something about your eye and your mind, you know, knows that it's not, it's not really there. Exactly. There's always something that's a telltale sign, even subconsciously, that there's something not right about it. Mm -hmm. In the remake, I actually liked the remake. I thought it was really well done. I don't know what you thought of it, but mm -hmm. uh, I thought the uh, probably the worst scene is the opening with I think because I thought the uh, the sc the scalp the scalping right at, at the beginning looked, just didn't look good. You know, I um, I my feeling was that they should not have shown it right at the beginning. That they that the, the you take the same scene. And when he goes to scalp her, I would have done a whip pan to the wall and shown mm. a silhouette of what he's doing and let mm. the audience sort of imagine it, you know, mm -hmm. but you'd see him in silhouette doing what he was doing. Because I think showing it right at the beginning just diminishes the impact later on. I yeah. think that right. you want to kind of tease an audience a little bit. And I didn't feel, you know, I kind of felt that that's the way I would have, if I was directing it, that's the way I would have staged it. I would have mm -hmm. kind of played with the audience a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously you mentioned Tom, uh, Tom Savini earlier. Uh, did you know Tom Savini before uh, doing Maniac? No. You probably knew of um, him, but did you know him personally? No, I didn't know Tom personally. Uh, what happened was um, when we got ready to do Maniac, I, I had seen Dawn of the Dead, um, and I had seen Dawn of the Dead before it was ever released. I mm -hmm. saw it at a, at a private screening. I literally snuck into the projection booth <laughs> and watched it. And I thought the, 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 the makeup of, I thought the movie was spectacular, but I thought mm -hmm. the makeup mm -hmm. effects were, were eye-popping. Uh, and, and so I knew that that's the guy I wanted to do the special makeup effects. So I tracked Tom Sabini down when we were in pre-production on Maniac, and he was in, happened to be in New Jersey shooting Friday, the first Friday the 13th. Mm -hmm. So Joe, Andy, and myself, we, we drove over to uh, the set of Friday the 13th uh, to meet with Tom. We had you know, prearranged it, and, and we went to meet with Tom and told him about the movie we're making. He was impressed that Joe was involved and um, said, yeah, I would do it. But he goes, I need a place to stay in New York. I just broke up with a girl in Pittsburgh, and I really don't want to go back there. So we arranged for a place for Tom to stay. Um, and so he, he came right from Friday the 13th to New York to work with us on Maniac. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And we became really good friends. We, again, there was an instant bond between Joe and myself and Tom uh, you know, Tom is a, is a man child. He always will, was, and always <laughs> will be. And uh -huh. so we just really, really got along well with him. Mm -hmm. And, and that's when I learned that he was a Vietnam, uh, photographer who was tasked mm -hmm. with, um, photographing the aftermath of battles. And so, um, by photographing all these extremely gruesome sites, was he was, in, in, it really informed his his makeup mm -hmm. and uh and so it's kind of interesting that something yeah. so horrific uh is what he, he it's kind of a cathartic mm -hmm. thing for him to do what he did in movies like uh dawn of the dead mm -hmm. yeah i remember him talking about that at like a uh, convention i was at and he like uh even said like people uh, would say, oh, we need more blood, like in a decapitation. And he was like, uh, no, really, this is like what it would be like because he's actually seen them. And it was like, you know, the guy is like, wow, that's, you know, not everyone's seen an actual decapitation, you know, and, and he's actually. Used yeah, I mean, I, I can't imagine the scars that uh, that Tom has from, you know, that, those experiences. It's, uh, I, it's, you know, it's a horror that none of us would ever want to live through. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't wish that on anyone. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Dawn of the Dead. Uh, for me, that's always the, the, the best zombie movie ever made. Uh, would you agree with that, or what's your favorite zombie movie? You even like zombie movies. No, I love zombie movies. Mm -hmm. 
I I have to say, um, I still am partial to the original Night of the Living Dead. Mm -hmm. I just love that movie. I think it's just, there's something about the creepiness of the original Night of the Living Dead that as great as Dawn of the Dead is, it just lacked it. You know, there was something about that, the way, you know, Night of the original Night of the Living Dead. I, I, as I say, I love Dawn of the Dead, but my preference would be to be would be Night of the Living Dead. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, trying to think, uh, I don't know if you consider Carnival of Souls to be a zombie movie, mm-hmm. but that's also again one of my favorite uh, movies of all time, favorite horror mm-hmm. film, oh, yeah. and I think it is really you can classify it. Yeah, it could be a ghost movie, you know. Yeah. So, uh, along those lines, uh, I assume you're always a horror movie fan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What were the ones that, you know, you you watched and, like, you were like, you know, this I would like to make these someday? Um, well, I mean, the ones that, I mean, Night of the Living Dead. Um, uh, I've loved uh, Honeymoon Killers. Uh, and uh, Daughters of Darkness, um, Carnival of Souls, uh, I'm trying to think of some others. You know, of course, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, Death Dream. Um, These are movies that all really uh, made an impact on me, as well as the Dario Argento and Lucio Fulci movies and Mario Bava movies. Uh, You know, these all really... uh, really uh, made an impression. Yeah. Uh, uh, were your parents cool with you watching horror movies? <clears throat> um, we never really discussed it. I'm sure they would have preferred I was less interested in horror films because <laughs> I, I would buy, I was a, I was the kind of kid who went to the, to the corner store to buy every issue of famous monsters. Oh, the hell day yeah. it came out. Yep, I did this. So I had quite a few uh, famous monster magazines laying around the house. Plus, I had set up in a room in the house. Uh, I had built all those Aurora monster models. Oh, that's and awesome. I, yeah, and I'd set up a shelf in in a in a in a in a, in a room in the house where I had my monster models in, on display. Yeah, yeah, they might have preferred I chose different things, but. <laughs> You know they were they were they didn't they didn't share my love of horror. Let me put it to you that way. Okay. Uh, um, did they get to see uh, your uh, maniac or any of your movies? Oh yeah, they um, they they were. I guess they were proud that I ma- uh, of maniac because it was a success, mm-hmm. and uh, I was at the time I was twenty five years old. So uh, and and I had dropped out of high school. And uh, so they, 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 they didn't have a, a bright, they didn't see a bright future for me. And uh, so when I had a success like Maniac, they were like, oh, maybe this kid isn't as stupid as we think. <laughs> uh, so uh, what, like, uh, what is your background in, in like, uh, did you go to film school or were you like self-taught? Um, well, my background was, was, was practical. I was... Uh, I worked as a production assistant on on many um, New York films, uh, independent films, uh, and a lot of them were adult movies because of you know that period uh, in the early '70s when there was a a boom uh, following the success of Deep Throat. Everybody wanted to cash in on it, so they were making a lot of 35 millimeter, um, you know, in, uh, theatrically uh, uh, driven adult movies. So, um, yeah, so, uh, and then I was working on, as, you know, some, you know, some mainstream films, uh, like across 110th street, I mentioned seven ups, uh, a movie called crazy Joe. And then I worked in editing. I, I got, I worked as an apprentice, an unpaid apprentice in an editing facility. I, I used to go there and, and work, uh, to all hours. I just loved it. I, and I was learning all aspects of editing. And this mm-hmm. was all before I was uh, 20 years old. Yeah. So did you do all the editing on your movies? Um, 
pretty much. I mean, some you know later I I didn't do I I would I had editors, and I'm not going to take away because I always I love having an editor, so I have mm-hmm. somebody objective looking at the material. But I would go in and do tweaks and things like that. But I I can't say I edited them. I did my early films, and probably a lot of Maniac I edited in Vigilante. Um, and I did, you know, the adult movies where I edited them. Um, but, uh, that's, um, yeah, that, yeah. that was it. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about uh, on Maniac when you do stuff like in the restroom, like, uh, is that a real restroom at like, uh, in a subway and, uh, no. how, how do you get a, how do you get like, oh, it isn't. Okay. No, um, that was a restroom at a YMCA on 23rd street, just near the, uh, uh, Harlem river drive, uh, near the east side, uh, was it the east side highway? Mm -hmm. It was not in the subway. All right. But no, so I assume it was, it was after hours. We added all the graffiti and stuff. None of that was there. It was clean. Okay. Uh, did you have to get rid of it after? (laughs) Yes. What, what you want? Wash it off. What's that? Did you have to get rid of the uh, graffiti after you were Done. Oh yeah, yeah, but it was easy because it was all. It wasn't paint. It was, it was <laughs> yeah. something that is easily removable. Oh, okay. I don't know it's exactly like a water what the substance thing is. or something. Yeah, yeah, it was really easy. You just wash down the walls after. Yeah, uh, I just want to bring this up because I was watching the uh, the Cisco Niebert specials, and then it it brought me into some other videos of the time, and uh, you know they're saying that um, these kind of movies inspired violence against women. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, and you know, how did you take that at the time when people started to say things like that? Well, the truth is, is I, I, what I always looked at is it was a depiction of violence, that it was catch-up, that it wasn't to be taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I never saw the, the nexus between um, people that did actual murders and <laughs> right. movies like Maniac. I mean, I looked at murderers as being far more complicated, especially uh, that we did a lot of research on serial killers when we uh, we, when we did Maniac. We found Mm -hmm. the common denominator among serial killers was a dysfunctional relationship with their mothers, and Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't about them uh, inhabiting uh, grindhouses, watching horror films. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I just never saw the connection. I, I, I thought it was too simplistic uh, a, a stretch uh, to say, oh, horror is, you know, we could blame horror for, for, for killers. And it's just not the case. It, it was, it's too simplistic. And, it, and um, you know, it's, it's just not, it just doesn't make any sense, you know. I mean, look, mm-hmm. you, you see a movie like Taxi Driver, where a guy becomes obsessed over over Jody uh, Foster. Mm-hmm. I mean, she didn't commit any murders in it, and you know, it, so people can look at movies and take away whatever it is that 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 you know that they find that they were you know yeah. attracted think, to or whatever. I mean, yeah. I can see people actually finding. Um, you know, uh, I could see people with a with you know finding things in in Disney movies that would bother them. You know, that could trigger something. I don't know. People are complicated. They're not simplistic. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the the human mind isn't a very simple thing to explain. Mm-hmm. You can't explain it. You know, yeah. you can't explain. It- you know how 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 people ordinary people become Nazis and shove people in in, in ovens. You know, mm-hmm. the people that were Nazis were not inherent inherent monsters, but they're driven to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get into politics, but I see a lot of that today. You see people that are that are following people that you'd say, My God, how can you follow these people? They they're mm-hmm. you know, they they you know, they you're dealing with you know, these uh megalomaniacs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say about the the horror movies. I think uh, if someone's uh, going to do something horrible, they're they're probably going to find like their motivation in, in anything. Uh, Charles Manson was, you know, uh, a lot of stuff was off the Beatles song. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, if it, you know, yeah, I mean, to, to, to suggest we're going to ban Beatles songs and and we're going to ban horror movies and we're going to ban all you know 
it just doesn't it just doesn't it doesn't work. Do I think horror films should be shown to children? No, I think it's adult entertainment. I think mm. you should be at least, you know, uh, 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 you know, over 13 years old, over 15 years old to be watching horror films. Um, I don't I, I don't think kids, you know, younger should be should have a steady diet of horror films, but they're going to see them. The same way they're going to see pornography and the same way they're going to see, you know, it's it's mm. just the way it is. Um, you know, horror films were shown all over the world. It doesn't, it, you know, the fact that we have the highest concentration of, of murders in this country over all other countries, um, you know, you can't point to horror films and video games. Mm -hmm. There's got to be something else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well... I, I, you don't really uh, direct anymore. You do produce a, a bunch of uh, films. Uh, when yeah. did you, when did you, uh, you know, go from uh, director to, to producer? And was there any reason? Well, I didn't really make a conscious this this, this decision to do that. I mm -hmm. really um, kind of uh, tr transitioned into um, as I was. I was. A, it was a hobby for me to go out and buy rights to movies and put them out on laserdisc. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, uh, this new format DVD was on the horizon, and mm -hmm. uh, and I started getting involved with it, and it and it grew immediately, and uh, I had a real business in it, and so um, it was never a conscious de de decision to abandon directing. It was always that I just sort of went with the flow, you know. Yeah. And time moves on. Mm hmm. Would you ever want to uh, go back and, and direct a movie? Oh, sure. It would. I, I, I've thought about it. I've, I've looked for material and, and with with the hopes of doing it. But you know, the business is a little more complicated today. It wasn't as um, as it was back in the eighties. Uh, you know, it's become concentrated with uh, companies like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. Uh, YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, the, it, it's it's different. You know, there's no place at the table, really, for most independent movies uh, mm -hmm. in the theaters. And uh, you know, it's it's um, you know, if you go out and fortunate enough to raise the money, it becomes a bit of a crapshoot. Yeah. Now you just mentioned about you know uh, getting to the uh, laser discs and then uh, DVDs and Blu-rays, and but now with all those streaming sites. Has that hurt uh, DVD and Blu-rays? And do you, some people say, you know, there will be no physical uh, uh, medium well, at some point. I could tell you, I could tell you from experience that mm -hmm. I find it uh, a weird kind of thing with 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 digital and video. I'll have movies, as an example, that are modest, if it maybe even call them poor sellers, on physical media do very, very well on, this, on digital media. And, uh, you know, and then I see some across the board do well, you know, from physical and digital. Uh, they, they do well. So I, I, I don't really see um, an erosion because the business that I'm in in Blue Underground is creating collector editions of movies, uh, mm -hmm. releasing those kinds of films, and... Um, and the collectors still gravitate towards physical media because you can't get all those bonus materials on digital media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Myself, I, I love the specials. I love listening to, to the commentary tracks and yeah. I've had a lot of, uh, you know, independent, uh, you know, current directors on. And a lot of them say that they, uh, who didn't go to film school, say they learned a lot about making movies, listening to commentary tracks. I still listen to commentary tracks and I still learn. Mm -hmm. you have any particular favorites of uh, commentary tracks? I mean, I would say that there were quite a few early um, Criterion mm -hmm. uh, cri uh, tracks that I, I listened to that, that were very good. Um, you, know, quite, uh, uh, you know, what was always good was Michael Winner. He did great commentaries. Um, he was really, really good uh, and informative. I mean, it really mm -hmm. depends. You know, a lot of directors are kind of, um, I don't know, guarded, and those are mm -hmm. less interesting. But when you get somebody like a Martin Scorsese, 
someone yeah. who's who really is it likes to teach those are the ones that i really i really love listening to yeah yeah like, like, like uh, goodfellas has like a few commentary tracks uh he is just great on it and then also the cop and crook one where it's uh it's it's henry hill and, and the guy who actually caught him uh-huh. was in the movie and uh it's it's just a i love the movie anyway but uh just something yeah. fun listening to that because you can really tell that the uh the FBI guy, like he actually has a lot of fondness for the, uh, for like the, the, um, the mafia guys. Like he, even though they're bad guys, but like he, you could tell like he enjoyed them in a way. This was very interesting. To listen to. Well, there, you know, I look at cops and, 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 and gangsters as being two sides of the same coin. Mm-hmm. They usually grow up in the same neighborhood. You know, it's just one goes one way, the other goes in the other, but really they, they, they fundamentally come from the same place. Mm-hmm. No, it's like uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis on commentary because I always think he has the best voice. But <laughs> yeah, no, he's very good. Yeah, uh, I don't know if I listen to his commentaries or not, but yeah, I, I would suggest. I would imagine. It, I, I, it, yeah, it's uh, just no knock on Herschel Gordon Lewis movies because I, I love him, but. After you listen to, to his commentary, you think you just watch, you know, uh, The Godfather or, or uh, uh-huh. you know, like, oh, yeah. God, this must be the greatest movie ever made. But I, I find it very entertaining. So what did you think of the Maniac uh, remake? Um, I, 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 um, I would say probably um, I, I wish they hadn't done that POV uh, mm-hmm. idea. I think it was probably on paper it was – looked as being distinctively different than the original. And, and that's, I think what they wanted to make, put their own stamp on it. But Mm -hmm. I kind of felt that when you have a world-class actor, like Elijah Wood, I want to see him and having that POV thing, I think really trapped them stylistically that it kind of hurt. I kind of hurt a little bit, Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but that's my opinion. I, I could be wrong. Um, and, um, and I also felt taking it out of New York to LA, uh, the problem with LA is even the most, um, uh, you know, the most depressed sections of downtown LA look really good. They don't look depressed. They don't look grimy and they don't look, you know, they don't have that, that drab look to them. Versus mm-hmm. New York, you could be in a very expensive neighborhood, and 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 it has that look to it. Yeah. So I don't know. I kind of felt taking it out of New York uh, was something I I kind of missed. But overall, I think you know it's a very it's very well made, and you know I think everybody you know did their best, and uh, and as I said, I really like Alex and um, and uh, and Elijah, and I. Really thought these guys, you know, did a good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I liked it overall too. I actually don't like the point of view part either, or uh, just some of the CG stuff. But uh, overall, it was uh, I went in not wanting to like it because I really liked the original movie. But uh, uh, it was you were really surprised. I think it's one of uh, one of the more interesting remakes. Yeah, well, good, good. I'm glad. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully, Maniac Cop, you'll feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, for, and uh, actually, our next guest coming up is a uh, Seb Godin, who's uh, you know he's only like twenty. He's been making movies, and he wanted to let you know that he loves uh, Uncle Sam. Oh well, thank him for me. Oh well, and, uh, I love that too. Name, I, was, I, I find it uh, Seb, Seb. His full name is Sebastian, but he goes by Seb. Seb Godin. Okay. okay. Yeah. What film did he make? Uh, he just made uh, Like Canimator which is about uh, this weird, slimy uh, werewolf. And then he's got coming up next is Slimoids, about little... He likes very slimy monster movies, so... Got uh, it. Yeah. Well, I'll let you get to him. Um, all right. All right, well, thank you. I had a, it, was, it was fun chatting with you guys. You had a good time. I'm yeah. sorry if any technical problems. It's okay. You'll work out the bugs. <laughs> well, so we've been doing it for 13 years, so. <laughs> oh shit! Then, then you really have a lot to apologize for. <laughs> I thought this was like I thought I was your your like the first of a few shows or something. Yeah, it's like uh, number four or fifteen, I think. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, 
Okay, you got some work. I to shouldn't do. have said that. Now he's yeah. Now he's just. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, thank you, though. I do appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye. You too. Bye. Hi, this is Steve Mitchell, director of King Cohen and the co-writer of Chopping Mall, and you are listening to Without Your Head. <laughs>